Hello, my name is Kathleen Strauss, and thank you so much for joining me today. I have the distinct pleasure of talking today with Joey Remini. She is a vestibular audiologist, and we're talking to her on the front of the launch of her new book called Rock Steady. And you had vertigo and tinnitus yourself, and sort of used yourself as um, an experiment to find your journey and path to healing. So I can't think of a more um, qualified person to bring to us today um, some awareness and understanding about the potential that lies within each one of us. Thanks, Joey, for being here all the way from Australia to Texas today. Yeah, thank you for that beautiful interview. It's really nice to be here. So you, you had not only been working with clients first and, and patients with problems, but then you experienced it yourself. Um, so many of our patients here in the U.S. and probably still all over the world go through a, um, a typical visit to the doctor and testing and, and treatments that are available. What happened to you and how did that show you that maybe you had uh, something new to offer people? I feel like my personal journey was very secondary to witnessing on repeat, like literally hundreds, which became thousands of my patient stories. Um, and, I, and I am sharing my personal hearing story in a separate interview, but in mm -hmm. a nutshell, I, I think I always had a lot of sensitivities all through my childhood, which started with asthma and hospitalization. And um, I was highly anxious. My mom had migraines, so my mom would take days off and be in bed and had dizziness. And so there was a lot of things that were kind of not really regarded as major medical catastrophes. But once I was working in the vestibular audiology clinic, studying at Melbourne University, learning more about the ears, I started to better understand some of these distortions and sensory mismatches I was seeing and feeling and sensing. And then just like so many other people, when I did go through a very stressful and traumatic period, everything went louder and went stronger and went more intense. So I was suddenly going from experiencing mild mishaps and distortions that I could move through and kind of ignore and push through to experiencing much more distressing sensations and then being in the elite um, kind of medical hospital university. Right setting and talking directly with neurologists and saying, I think I've got my vestibular migraine. And actually one of the neurologists, my colleague was like a tea break conversation. He's like, yeah, I get it too. He's like, it's not uncommon. It's just that when people don't understand what they're feeling and sensing, it can create a great panic loop. Mm. So it's, I think it's something like up to one in three people experience bothersome tinnitus or bothersome dizziness. I mean, Correct. everybody listening to this call will know somebody who has experienced. Right. It's not that unusual now, I realize. Um, and there's a great spectrum of these triple PD type sensations in the, pop, the normal population. Tell people what triple PD is. So persistent postural perceptual dizziness. It's like a chronic unexplained right. dizziness where you can have actually normal medical results, but you just feel rotten and awful and you're not necessarily trusting your feet underneath you and your head can feel like an astronaut or this very disembodied, dissociated feelings. I think this is where integrative therapies really comes into the conversation because the beautiful doctors who we love and respect for their expertise, they're helping us find medical explanations for what we're feeling and sensing. And, and sometimes that leads to idiopathic, which means we don't medically know why this is happening. And they write it down in their report. And then that label goes off into the abyss of the medical world. And that's actually what we want it to do. But what happens, unfortunately, is we can then take on these labels, whether yes. it's many ears or vestibular migraine or labyrinthitis or just a basic inner ear disorder. And we own it and we become it. And then we can actually become quite debilitated by this new label when actually I'm Joey. I'm always Joey. I never stop being Joey. And no matter what label I'm given and how the medical world want to treat that label, that actually has nothing to do with me. And even if medical options are presented to me, it's my choice if I follow through with it. I don't have to do what the doctors recommend. And in fact, 
it's really nice to find a doctor who you have a philosophical relationship with and a cultural connection to. Um, so A, if they give you medical clearance, you really trust and believe them. You're not kind of going, well, what if you miss something? And surely there's something. You want to have that relationship of trust. And then also there are many options. And as I was saying earlier, it was very distressing for me at times with my sensations, but because I had such a deep understanding of the, the inner ears and the miracle of them and their redundancy and robustness mm -hmm. and the proprioceptive touch system, which through my yoga background, I had a very strong connection to my body. I could actually really begin to manipulate the messages going to my brain. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was able to play with neuroplasticity in very conscious and intelligent ways. And no one was teaching me to do this. I was just drawing upon all the little bits of knowledge I had from this extraordinarily eclectic educational background. And so as I was feeling and sensing things, I was able to draw upon different systems to calm, quiet and steady my brain and to give the brain the inputs it really was missing. And that's what happens with tinnitus and vertigo is the brain inputs are either overwhelmed or underwhelmed or somehow in a conflict, in a mismatch. And we need to give the brain clarity to, to rearrange its filters and to rearrange its priorities. So what I'm saying here is if we can actually learn to understand the miracle of the body and work with the body, we actually avoid falling into chronic anxiety loops and panic loops, which is not only highly uncomfortable, and I had a, a four-year period of it being really difficult for me. So not, not only is it exhausting and highly uncomfortable, it actually, it doesn't help the healing process of the brain, the ears, the eyes and the spinal column to renormalize um, healthy balance and to minimize or eliminate the, the tinnitus sounds from our awareness. So we can get stuck in chronic symptoms, whether that's sounds or sensations, if this neuroplasticity process is either overlooked and if someone doesn't know how to use it, and it's really impeded by chronic stress and worry and anxiety. So the body will prioritize fight, flight, freeze, threat, alert over the healing process. So we have to move through the anxiety in a very personal way. It's often not a generic fix. So we can then enter the neuroplasticity process. And like I say, that took me four years and I had all that yeah. training. And that's really what led me to want to, create resources to support people to do it more quickly than I did it. So it's it, acknowledging the fact that this anxiety plays a role in probably any patient's journey towards finding out what's wrong with them and then yeah. choosing and selecting a medical professional or a practitioner to help them and then believing and trusting that the therapy or treatment that's offered to them is actually going to work. Um, as I study and understand more about the scope of complementary and alternative approaches for vestibular patients, I see that belief in treatment is important whether we're taking a pill from our doctor or whether we're believing that meditation and focusing on breath will help yeah. us calm down. These belief and trust um, is universal whether we're looking at medicine or complementary or integrative approaches. Um, yeah. how do we help people understand that it's still effective intervention, even though it requires faith? Well, I'm not one for persuading or convincing people. I'm, I, I really sit in this place of saying, actually don't have blind faith and don't listen to random recommendations. And that can be a very expensive goose chase that depletes you because if someone recommends A, you try A and it fails. And then someone recommends B, you try B and it fails. And someone else recommends C and you try C and it fails. Every time you're actually depleting your sense of self and resilience and it just gets harder and harder and harder. And so with neuroplasticity, it's about actually saying, well, what do I feel right now? And what do I want to do with that feeling? So this is a here and now therapy. So it might be right now, I'm actually just feeling lonely. Okay, well, let's move, let's address the loneliness here and now. And, and we can give the self-compassion and lean into that and do whatever we need to do with that loneliness. And this, this is where the self-discovery comes in. It's like, well, when I'm lonely, what do I need? And that's a different answer for every person. 
Once we address the loneliness, then we can sort of say, well, what do I want to feel? It might be, well, I really want to feel relaxed in my body and going to get a massage would help me achieve that. So I'm going to go to a trusted massage therapist because I know myself and I know my connection to that therapist. And I know that that's actually what I'm desiring in this moment. So rather than someone randomly saying, get a massage every week, it's a person saying, actually, this is something I need for me today. So I'm going to book it in. Then I have something to look forward to. And it's coming at a, at a personally empowered, from a personally empowered place. And also it's taking into consideration the relationship you have with that massage therapist, which is what you're getting at, um, Kathleen, that it's about our belief in the exchange. And a huge part of that is not what the therapy is they're offering. It's who the person is and how we relate to that person and whether we trust that person. Yes. And that's what the research is showing. It doesn't matter how many PhDs the therapist has or what technique they use. It's is their trust. That's right. And it's the, thank you. Thank you for rephrasing that in a way that I think is important um, because for those who will um, benefit from whatever the first practitioner they see, you know, they might get treatment and get better. And then those that, that don't get better and have to go from one place to the next to the next, those chronic patients or those who have trouble navigating the medical system seem to take on a sense of that they're responsible for why they're still sick and they judge themselves. And so I like how um, not only a trusting relationship with a practitioner is important, but that you talk about getting rid of shame and getting rid of a label, a label of maybe you have an unknown diagnosis, or maybe it's all in your head, or some people are told it's stress. Um, so whether it's a, a real diagnosis or a guess, which a lot of medicine is guessing, um, people tend to, we, we put labels on ourselves, and that becomes yeah. and impacts our ability to get better. What? Well, I can, I can speak to that personally. So I know that, I'll, so my specialty comes in in how the brain is developed and how we can adapt and the brain is very changeable. And, and so we have nerves and neurons communicating up and down our body all day long from our eyes to our ears, to our skin and nose and tongue. And this is helping us navigate the world. It's, it's, we're a miracle. And from a very young age is, is how we learn to exist in the world. And that's when our neural maps are being set. But of course, we're very young and inexperienced and immature. And so often as we come to adults, we're like, oh, why do I even believe that? Why do I think that? That doesn't match my adult life. And that's where inner child work and therapies and self-discovery can help us redesign who we are and how we see the world. And something I learned through this process is as a very little girl, so actually as a one-year-old, a baby, I had asthma, I'm blacking out, I was in hospitals. And I think from that young, I started to believe that I was a total failure. I couldn't even breathe. I had so much shame and anxiety that rippled all the way through my childhood and young adult years. That, that was further triggered when I had the tinnitus and when I had the vertigo. Um, it was just like, well, I'm just fundamentally wrong. I'm abnormal. I'm broken. And that belief was so deep because it really started all the way back when I was a little girl. And so some of my healing was about readdressing my relationship to myself and to my body and recognizing, well, actually that makes a lot of sense. I would believe that as a little girl getting shuffled around hospitals and school rooms with ventilators on my face. Right. It makes sense that I would feel broken and abnormal. Doesn't make it true. So I had to start re, um, re-evaluating my sense of self. And that was really critical to my healing because if I go around every day believing I'm abnormal and I need fixing, that's the spiritual belief piece. That changes how my neurons fire and changes the chemical cocktails, the brain chemistry, because it's more likely to keep me in fight, flight, freeze with all the cortisols and adrenalines and the, the, the yucky feeling brain chemistry and that actually prevents my body to re-navigate normal, healthy, quiet, peaceful, steady pathways. So taking on this shame and blame, A, is really normal. I've personally experienced it, but doesn't mean it's not reversible. And that's, again, it's a super personal self-inquiry of, of what am I feeling? What am I believing? Do I want to be here? How can I take my power back? And, and bring in a loving kindness perspective. Where could I be compassionate towards myself? And as 
I help Joey heal. So it's like Joey mentoring and supporting Joey. It's this self talk, self inquiry. I actually then change the brain chemistry. I change the chemical cocktails firing through my body as I give myself compassion, get more oxytocin moving and get more feel good neurotransmitters flowing. So I think what I'm noticing in my clients all around the world is a, the diagnostic pathway is confusing and exhausting pretty much in every country. This feeling of shame and feeling abnormal is ubiquitous and feeling stuck, helpless, hopeless, powerless. It's everywhere. And people are turning a corner and really beginning to heal and to feel confident and feel steady and feel a sense of inner peace. Once they learn, all right, so here's my anatomy. Here are my ears and my eyes and my spinal column. Here's my brain and my neurons. And now I'm starting to learn how I can tweak it, how I can change it, how I can support the healing. And now I'm learning why Kathleen couldn't do it for me, why Joey couldn't do it for me, why the doctor couldn't do it for me. Because as much as we would love to, we can't go in with a tweezer and move one neuron from there to there. And it's so complex, we wouldn't even know where to start. Medicine doesn't fully understand neuroplasticity. We have speculation and theories but it's it's incredibly complex physical mental emotional spiritual and the only person who can rewire your neural setting would be you and the only person who can rewire joey's neural settings is joey and so on so it's this personal process so are you saying that are you saying that then in your opinion that there are those who go to a doctor and get a diagnosis and get a treatment and if there hasn't been some um, maladaptive neuro training or neuro pathways developed, they might get better and never need to be um, in a rock steady program or looking for your approach because they're not chronic. I mean, there are those people who come into the system, they get what they need, they take a pill or they take a treatment and they get better and, and they're done. And that's good. Um, do those people benefit from this program or are most of your clients who you have developed this work for, and we're going to talk specifically about it. Um, are they those who the medical model didn't work and they didn't get what they needed? Look, to be honest, I, I openly don't recommend, I don't recommend my program to anyone because I built the program for anyone experiencing unwanted sensations. And it's like, I feel icky. I don't like this feeling. Some of my clients actually don't want to take medications. The options there okay. and they're like, I just don't want to be medicated. Some people are, are like, look, I've done physiotherapy. I've done psychology. I'm just, I, I feel 80%. I don't quite feel I'm back to myself yet. And then other people are super chronic, have tried everything, are still medicated and they're just lost and they're, they're like, you know what? I didn't even get what Joey's talking about, but I think I need to come back to myself. So I'm just going to follow that hunch. There is such a broad spectrum. I don't recommend it to anybody because I don't know you. Like, mm -hmm. To be honest, even if it was someone like my mother who I know really, really well, I wouldn't even say to her, mom, I recommend my program. I would say, mom, why don't you just listen to my masterclass and just see if you get a feel for what I'm on about. And if that's going to help you with your unwanted sensations and it resonates for you, I'll give it to you. Right. She has to choose it for herself because I could never go in as that external expert and say, this is what you need because I don't know. No matter how close I am to you, I don't know what you're feeling and I don't know what you're needing. It's such an interesting shift from the authoritarian positioning of most healthcare providers of the past, when I trained 30 years ago, you know, you learn that you're the expert, you know, and the people coming to you, you're going to tell them what they need to do because you know about it and they don't. This is such a paradigm shift. This turns all that upside down to say, I don't know what you need, but you do. Yeah. And I can't recommend anything. If this resonates with you, take it. That is, that, that's turning it, the traditional model just upside down. But I know it's happening and I know it's working and I know it's resonating with people, to use your word. Um, but it is a real paradigm shift from my mother's generation who went to Doc Marcus Welby, MD, which was an American television show years ago, you know, the trusted mm. doctor who would come with his black bag to your house, sit down and treat the whole family and tell them what they needed. Mm. And you believed it. And to question your doctor yeah. was I've, not done. I've got, I've got something to say on this because 
So I finished my, tr my vestibular training in 2008 and I started my yoga training just over 20 years ago. So yoga is actually my first discipline. And then I went through the psychology, neuroscience, vestibular audiology training later on. And it was the same for my training. And to a certain extent, even the yoga, I'm, I'm sorry to say there was even that sort of authoritarian bullying. I'm the expert, you know, do this with your body, listen to me. Wow. There was even that through my yoga training, that kind of, you don't know what you're doing, you young girl, come on, listen to me. So, and in, and in India, it's just culturally different, but they can be, you know, if you're not doing what I'm saying, get out of my class. It can be really straight. And it, it's kind of endearing. You get to know it once you soften into the culture, but it can be jarring at first. It's like, whoa. But anyway, so that the same thing happened in the psychology, same right. thing happened in the vestibular audiology. It was very much um, we're the expert and we should first and foremost report to the doctor and then maybe give some kind of vague feedback to the client. So it was, it was almost like there was a wall between the client, the audiologist, and then the doctor. So nothing was really threaded together and integrated. And the concept of client-centered and patient-centered care was, was really, really new. And people would think they're doing it. They still do. I still have colleagues who think they're patient-centered and client-centered, and I can tell you now they're not. And so culture is slowly shifting. And I think I do what I do because of my experience. And I even shifted my, my alliances in the yoga world because the thing that really was such a blessing for me, even though it was difficult at the time, was a teacher said to me, oh, I can't even remember, but it was something like, um, don't listen to your body. You need to put your students first and you need to teach yoga. It's community service. And even if you're tired and run down, you have to show up. And I was like, on every level, that just does not resonate with me. Like, if I'm burning myself out, how can I even really be a role model who's living the eight limbs of yoga and embodying this sense of self-compassion and self-inquiry. So that's when I really went off on my own track and developed a self-compassion based approach to yoga and teaching people to listen to themselves because that's what I suddenly so you're rebellious. Like. Your innovation came out of a rebellion to what, you know, was you were yeah. being taught a little bit of like, mm. And same in the medical world. Like I got told of being, I got tired of being told what to do and it not feeling right for me, but being told to do it anyway. Um, and so then I wanted to be an option and I'm not saying rock steady is for everybody. I know it's not, but for those people who want to have the power and the control to choose what they want, when they want, based on what they authentically experientially feel, this is the ticket. This is the pathway to saying, I don't want that. I want this. I don't want that. I want this. And I want it now that I'm going to do in two weeks time. And really just being able to very much go in a, a deeper journey of healing. And a lot of my clients who go through this process, I'll call it the rock steady process. And my book describes why no one else can do it for you. Why no one else has taught you how to do it and, and how to get started. So it is a, it's a, it's a journey anyone can, can explore if they choose. But a lot of my clients will go from deep panic and disconnection and relationships breaking down, perhaps can't work, can't care for their kids appropriately. And through the end of the process, they're stronger. They've got better balance and physical muscle toning. They're emotionally able to self-regulate yeah. and self-soothe. They're spiritually more connected to who they are and they're beginning to become more aligned with what they're doing on the planet. So they're really coming out of it a much stronger person. And, and I actually use the analogy of a rebirth. It's like, you're not who you were. Let that go. Let's, let's redesign and rebuild. Instead of turning so the clock backwards, let's go forwards. And I can see them leaving the program and saying, I'm better than I was even before. So they, yeah. you know, their symptoms might be gone and then they're better all around because this is a foundational and holistic approach we're talking about mind and body and how you feel and teaching people to get in touch with that. So now we've got, just to, just to recap what we've done so far, we've said you have a program that is an alternative to the traditional 
medical experience that people might have. You can't say who it's for because if it resonates with anybody, it could be from, for anyone. Um, it's not for a certain subset of the population of patients with dizziness and balance disorders. It might be for anyone if it resonates with you. What is it that we're talking about? Rock Steady is the name of it. What is Rock Steady? What does that mean? And what does neuroplasticity have to do with it? Yeah, sure. So, um, first of all, I would say it's complementary to the medical model. I, I encourage all of my clients to continue seeing their doctors, to keep getting medical clearance as things change and evolve, and to tell their doctors what they're doing in Rocksteady and why and how it's going. So it's, it's incredibly complementary. It's not an either or. Okay, okay so it, it, it's part of the whole package. And in fact, a lot of doctors are just loving it because it gives clients just this incredible cushion to support them when they're not, you know, in the hands of the, it, it helps the doctors have something else, another resource. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no clash. What the doctors do, I don't do. And what I do, the doctors don't do. Right. And that makes it integrative to use the right terms because it's not yep. complementary. It's not alternative. I mean, it is complementary. It is not an alternative. It's integrative. So the neuroplasticity Beautiful. process is integrated. So first of all, it's an educational process. And this is really the piece that I was missing when I was going through this. I had all the fragments of education. I technically understood the ears. I technically understood neuroscience. I technically understood yoga and a practice and the daily embodiment and changing. And I had technical understanding of emotions and moving through emotions. And I had technical understanding of mental disorders and mental health. And then I had to piece it all together. And so this is really an education, educational package. In fact, I saw a client just the other day who works with Professor Staub at the Mayo Clinic. And he said to me, Rocksteady just has everything in one place. You know, instead of having to go to the physio over here and there's cognitive behavioral therapy there. And, you know, it's just everything under one, one umbrella. So we can learn and use real life practical skills and tools to understand what am I feeling? So that's certain nerves firing. When we feel anything, it's related to a nerve pathway. What do I need to address that feeling if it's a little bit uncomfortable or undesirable? And what do I want to feel and how can I generate that new firing pattern, that new neural map? So whatever we're feeling, we're firing and whatever we're firing, we're wiring. Love that. So Say that again. Feeling. Say that again, because I love that. Whatever we're feeling in our body in the present moment is what we're firing synaptically at that neuron, neuronal level. Whatever we're firing, we're wiring and, and yeah. automating. So unfortunately, if we are feeling anxiety and panic all the time, yeah. that's what we're looping and firing and hardwiring. It's reversible, so don't worry. I've been there. <laughs> but just to, that, that, that's kind of what happens, and that's why we feel not quite right all the time. There's this base anxiety firing and releasing that brain chemistry which knots the stomach and, you know, tightens the muscles and tightens the neck and we get the full package. However, if we can feel into self-compassion and loving kindness and we can begin to, to physically nurture ourselves and slow down and have, so Rocksteady includes strategies for persistent thoughts and worries. What do we do with them? How do we address these? We don't have to get rid of them, but how do we lean into them and use them and clean them up? And, it's also about our belief system. Do I believe I'm broken and need something out there to fix me? In which case I'm giving all my power away and I'm tired all the time. I have no vitality because I've given it away. Or do I believe actually I believe in the miracle of the body. Humans are designed to adapt. I've got education now. I trust the brain. I trust my ears. Even with permanent damage to my ears or brain, I can still heal. You know, my mom just went through a huge stroke last year and she's back to normal. Oh, huge wow. hole in her brain. It's amazing. Like, honestly, if we have the skills and tools to support neuroplasticity, the brain and body's capacity to change, adapt, evolve, and heal, the possibilities are really endless and no doctor or therapist can predict your outcomes. And what I'm seeing time and time and time and time and time again is people surprise themselves with how remarkably they heal. And this is of all ages, all genders, all diagnoses, and a range of time since onset. So like I said earlier, some people get symptoms and right away by rock steady because oh. they resonate with all of my banter. And they're just like, yes, that's great. Other people might wait 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Well, rock steady's only been around for three years, I think. 
so they've had it for 30 years and they're still able to go back to normal so time since onset is not a barrier it's really important people don't feel stuck it's about education so i hope that answered your question it's having a toolkit with a variety of physical mental emotional and spiritual resources so including basic vestibular rehabilitation basic yoga breath work the cbt the acceptance commitment therapy style processes um the CBT being cognitive behavioral therapy approach. Mm-hmm. Yep. And acceptance commitment therapy. And then of course, self-regulation, self-soothing, self-settling, the emotional aspects. Um, and then spiritually looking at beliefs or even surrendering to the divine, allowing a sense of letting go and trusting the change that may not always be for the worse. You know, I probably talked too much, but that was a big one for me. I had, mm. I had a really deep belief that just the sky was going to fall on me. Everything is doomed. I didn't trust anyone or anything. I had this really deep, anxious belief that bad things were going to happen to me. And that took a lot of surrender and trust and humility and forgiveness to really unwire that one. And I shamed myself for even having that belief, you know, so it's like the shame upon shame can loop too. And so this process of healing just takes us to such a deep, gentle, soft, humbling place if we allow it. It's so much more than physical rehab and repetition of exercises. It's a very subtle, invisible process because these are subtle, invisible symptoms. Wow, terrific. And that can be for anyone who wants to register for rock steady and you're saying you it it works together with their regular doctor's prescription if they're under some medical management plan um, with a doctor they can add this and this helps bring that holistic approach and so um i've said for a long time that um in vestibular rehabilitation when it began and it was about repetition of exercises and repetition of things we use the word habituation to say that by reintroducing the things that provoke your symptoms you're going to retrain your brain to sort of turn off that um, noxious stimulus uh, response to the stimulus that comes with these symptoms the symptoms brought about by moving a certain way Um, but when i saw people in fight or flight, panicked, afraid, and anxious, the brain couldn't respond yeah. with neuroplasticity to habituate. That I used to always say this. This goes back, this takes me way back. I said, if you're not better, it's either that you're not doing what I'm asking you to do, um, your problem is too big for the brain to address, or the part of your brain needed for compensation is damaged. Okay, now that used to be the three reasons I would tell people they couldn't get better. You're not doing what I said. Your brain, uh, the problem's too big for the brain to, uh, to recover from, or the part of your brain needed for recovery is damaged too. Now I add the next one, which has to do that when the patient is in this constant um, anxiety, uh, symptom anxiety loop, or when their nervous system is not able to receive um, healing in a way however it comes um, they can't get better and we can call that well you're too stressed you're too busy i can think of patients who you know i'm trying to get better with rehab i'm trying to do what you're saying i'm trying to want to get better but i have three kids grabbing at my feet go ahead i want to chime in here so with persistent postural perceptual dizziness which is this um chronic anxiety dizziness loop Mm -hmm. it's normal i want to reassure everybody listening when you feel dizziness or tinnitus it's extremely normal to feel anxiety because you want to protect yourself and you love yourself and you're like, I'm hearing something. I'm feeling something. Something's not quite right. You're you're doing all the perfect things. Your brain is responding with the natural anxiety, self-protection mechanism. That's perfect. That's what we want to happen in a healthy brain. It's just that it's not helpful to be locked in that. So the fact that it's happening is like, yes, my brain is working. I'm a healthy human being. I get a not quite right signal. I don't understand it. I respond with anxiety. It's like tick, normal, 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 healthy, healthy, healthy. So when we get this education about the brain, we can say, okay, so now it's my job as an adult using my prefrontal cortex. I need to step into that anxiety loop and say, it's okay. It's just a false alarm. And I need to find self-soothing techniques that work for me that help my brain get the message. 
So I actually say a different thing to you, Kathleen. I would say people are not healing if they're only doing what I'm saying, because I would be offering suggestions and, and things that I've seen work. But if people are only doing what I'm saying, they're actually not engaged in self-study, right? So I'd be like, well, the reason you're not healing is because you're probably not really dropping into a deeper part of you that says, all right, well, that worked for Joey and I tried that, but it's not quite right for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to tweak it and, and I'm going to experiment to see if I can really soothe myself more with my own created exercise that I've invented using Joey's guidance. So agreed, I, agreed to what you said. So when I was talking about those three things, I was talking about in the early days when it was just this black and yeah. white, we're going to treat patients this way. I and remember. what I learned was I used to tell people those things, which I'm embarrassed to say, I used to tell them, this is why you're not better. Um, but it's so much more than that. And, and obviously and we're you're learning. talking about and that. And, and we are. all experts and therapists and doctors are giving you the best knowledge they have yes. based on the science at the time and the training mm -hmm. at the time. And it's really important to hold all of these things lightly. And if things are not feeling right for you, they're probably not right for you. So my suggestion would be stay open, be surrounded by a community of people who love and hold you, who don't rush you. And the other thing is that the body can adapt and will adapt. And I'm going to blow, I hope I blow your mind here when I say healing doesn't actually mean you return back to who you were. That's not what healing is. It's impossible to turn back the clock and to be 10 years younger, right? And so for people who say, I just want to be like I was before the incident, I want to go back to that normal. I'm like, well, you're just going to wake up disappointed every day. So I suggest you change your goal. Healing means we're at peace with the body we're living in as it is in the moment. So for me, even if that means I'm in a full on anxiety freak out before the book launch, because it's anxious publishing a book. It's like, Normal. <laughs> what if it's not perfect? And what if I get judged by people who don't like me? Rah. So in that moment, healing would be saying it's normal to freak out. I'm allowed to panic. It's okay that I feel tight and I want to vomit and I'm nauseous and I'm giving myself a vestibular migraine again because of I'm just overwhelmed and I haven't slept because I've got a little baby. In that moment, I'm healed when I normalize it. I'm healed when I lean into it. I'm healed when I give myself what I need. I'm healed when I find my inner peace within the storm of life. And this is where some of that old paradigm that Kathleen and I were both trained in, it's about eliminating symptoms. It's about curing symptoms. It's about removing the discomfort. Whereas actually when we take the, take the ancient wisdom from yoga, the art of living is not about being perfect and feeling perfect. The art of living is about embracing uncertainty and gracefully living within uncertainty. It's about showing up authentically as it is and leaning into that with a perspective of loving kindness, acceptance, surrender, and allowing. Now, this doesn't mean you have to live with symptoms forever because what happens when we open up that new brain chemistry cocktail of loving kindness and compassion and surrender is we actually allow the brain to get more creative and build new pathways. We're no longer locked in the anxiety. We're no longer locked in the symptom cycles, which are repeating themselves elegantly. When we open up to loving kindness, curiosity and compassion, new pathways form. And those pathways might feel initially just like relief. It's like, oh, how long is this going to last for? And then it might turn into a bit of joy. It might turn into a bit of connection. It might turn into a bit of self-belief. All of those feelings are entire new neural pathways. They're entire new brain chemistry cocktail combinations. So instead of suddenly, instead of feeling all the time dizzy and tinnitus and anxious and frustrated and I just want to get rid of it and I don't like my body, instead of that, we don't actually change any of that. We just begin to open up with loving kindness, compassion, we start to notice more of our body instead of get locked up here in this little quadrant. We start to drop into our body and feel more. The body work is so important. And little by little, we start to notice, wow, I can feel my hips. I feel stronger. I feel stable. I feel steady. And I get people in my Facebook group all the time going, I'm loving my new sensations. It's amazing. You know, or people who say, I haven't been able to drive or work and now I'm working four days a week. And when I need to rest, I give myself rest. When I need a day off, I have my plan. So just to clarify, 
Rocksteady is both a book and an online program, and I'm not recommending either of them. I think the book is a great place to start. It's very accessible, and it really gives that introduction to the education and the why. Why am I like this? Why has no one told me about neuroplasticity? And can I get started? Do I want to get started? So that's my- I'll make people wait till the end to hear where they can find you. Let's tell them now, and then we'll tell them again at the end. Tell them where they can find you online. Seekingbalance.com.au or just Google Joey and Vertigo and I'll probably pop up. So yeah, seekingbalance.com.au. And I have just a really beautiful heart-centered community of peers all over the world from Africa to Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Northern Europe, UK. It's just a beautiful group of people and we share our healing. People are posting about how they're moving through discomfort, how they're finding and cultivating their inner peace. And that is the environment we need to be in because humans are the net result of the people we surround ourselves by. And if we're in vestibular communities where people are talking about their symptoms all day long, moaning about their bodies, blaming their bodies or blaming people, that is the chemical cocktail we will absorb, which will be the blame and shame and guilt and the anxiety and frustration. So it's really important we choose to be surrounded by people who are also practicing this self-compassion and loving kindness and acceptance and surrender because by being near them, we will actually mirror that and we will pick up more of that chemical, um, mm. the brain chemistry would generate within us. So having a supportive team is, is such a gift. I realize it's not always possible and that's where being online fills the gaps. If we don't have that local support, at least we can log in and we can click play and we can tune into the, the, all the live group calls, people all over the world undergoing therapy together and being supported because we're not alone. We are not alone. There's so many people out there really struggling with this and feeling hopeless. This is the hope. It is. And how amazing for such a broad, really, um, your perspective on recovery and what the program you made for, to, for you to package it and put it together and say it's a program, it had to have some structure to what sounds like an unstructured journey of self-discovery for each individual. So making it a package, if someone said, well, I'm interested in it, what does it require of me? Um, what would you say to that? What is, it, what is required for someone who wants to consider becoming a student of your program? I would probably just say willingness. It's, it's, it's really dropping into the beginner's mindset. Um, because for example, some, some people may have done five hours of vestibular rehabilitation therapy every day for a year, right? They've really just in a, in a panic, just done too much. And so coming into my program, it would be all right, well, how can I stand in my body with my eyes closed, which is an old vestibular re rehabilitation exercise I've done a thousand times. How can I now have the willingness to do this with a curious approach with the perspective of loving kindness instead of the old rigid, I just have to do this. I've got my timer on. I've got to do it three times a day. And, and that, a lot of my clients are like, wow, I'm still unlearning all my old habits. And it's really, it's really hard in the beginning to open up to this new perspective and have a willingness to go, okay, well, what's in my heart? How can I really body scan with non-judgment? Some people take three months just to learn how to body scan because they're in such a panic when they feel in their body. And that's normal. Like take the three months, have the willingness to understand that if you've had 10, 20, 30 years or like me, a lifetime of anxiety and panic, we are unlearning millions, if not billions of neural pathways. We are unlearning them. We're unknotting. So we have to give it time. And if you think about it taking three months, that's not very long in the scheme of a lifetime. Three months is a short amount of time to be unlearning and resetting and rewiring. Let's see if and we can take a, <coughs> so let's see if we can take a specific example with that. Yeah. Um, standing and feeling. A therapist would have you stand, close your eyes, and say, feel that you're swaying. And someone, I would guess, um, would say, I feel like I'm swaying. And then the answer might be, stop doing that. Keep the pressure equal on right and left foot, equal between heels and toes. Stop the swaying. Try to work on getting it plugged in and, and doing it. 
that would be one approach. Minimize what goes out of bounds. Stop the mm -hmm. swaying. Leaning into that might be, would it look different to say, allow yourself? What would, what would be different about rock steady and about leaning into experiencing what you're feeling? That wouldn't be, stop doing that, but what? Experience it, be curious about it? Yeah, well, there's, we get creative with it. So one of the exercises could be notice how much you can sway, maximize the sway, mm -hmm. play with it. Right. Know that your vestibular organs are going to keep you coming back to center. So if you move out this way, mm -hmm. they'll actually draw you back. And it's that right. concept of we have to be lost to be found. A leg have to be imbalanced to come back to balance and, and, and allow the rigidity to fall away. So it's mm -hmm. almost like being a dancer, put music on. So that could mm -hmm. be one approach is, is understand the sway is normal. It's healthy. And it's actually about, recalibrating balance instead of losing balance so we're, we're shifting the language we're reframing it it is um, i can see there's freedom in them just saying oh my gosh i've been trying to stop that and now you're letting me enjoy it and appreciate it and embrace yeah. it that's, the other, that's a huge shift and the other thing is is most of my clients want to find steadiness or inner peace i mean everyone has different goals but those categories are whether they've got tinnitus, dizziness, or both, they do usually want to feel at home in their body and ease in their body and some form of steadiness. They don't want to feel rocky and wonky and boat-like anymore. And I have to remind people, steadiness is not stillness. You're not trying to be a statue, right? If you try and be a statue, you're just going to look like you're constipated and really rigid. It's not natural and normal. So it's, it's about letting go of those, those old goals of rigidity and stillness and saying, actually, steadiness is almost a state of mind. I can be moving and dancing and still steady. So it's, it's about saying, okay, well, what is steadiness to me? And where do I feel steadiness in my body located? Do you feel it in your navel? Do you feel it in your hips? Do you feel it in your fingers and hands? Do you feel it in your elbows? Once you find that neural connection to the steadiness, focus there. Let it grow. Let it build. Give it color. Give it shape. Really get to know it. Study it. So this is where the standing exercises become a very deep therapy, mm -hmm. completely different to every person. Once someone becomes curious about that, that almost guarantees that they're going to come back for more, that they're going to try it some more because you can become um, really addicted to this exploration and this curiosity. And that would be wonderful. I would imagine that would feed compliance into a program or continued exploration of them in their journey through rock steady, just because they're saying, wow, this is, really exciting and different and I'm curious about that well I think in an ideal world and it's not believe me it's not all roses and unicorns and rainbows some there's some very difficult patches through rock city because we're going in to some troubled waters and asking some difficult questions of ourselves at times but in a ideal world neuroplasticity is purely about focusing on the desire well, conscious integrative neuroplasticity so when we're really designing it as a co-creator i'm saying okay right now i want to feel vitality i want to feel mental clarity i want to feel a sense of joy and ease in my body as joey that's what i'm choosing to be my projects this week what can i do to help me feel vitality mental clarity joy etc and then the reward is feeling those things so i might do my watercolor painting i might play my violin i might have cuddles with my little baby i might give myself naps to um give myself any lost sleep so i'm designing choices based on my very specific goals of ways i want to feel everything comes back to feeling the reward is in pausing and feeling it so when i'm cuddling my son i'm not thinking about what's going to happen for dinner or the, the to-do list i'm like oh that's right my goal is to feel joy i'm gonna lean i'm gonna feel the softness of his hair i'm gonna i'm gonna stay here a bit longer and i'm gonna let that cocktail the dopamines the feel-good neurotransmitters have a little bit more say i'm gonna let the brain know hey prioritize that pathway because that's when i want to build more robust neural highways i want to fire that i want to feel it i want to wire it so i make these little micro choices in my day and then ultimately with time and with practice and with persistence and willingness, it automates and the joy is accessible more often. And this sounds like getting people into the moment. And I yeah. love the 
visual image that comes to mind when you talk about appreciating the feel of a baby's head and hair and <laughs> the cuddling because it makes us stop this treadmill that we're on of this busy life and be present in the now. It's very trendy to talk about mindfulness and the approach and so forth. Is this part of this mindfulness, um, which actually has quite a lot of scientific research to support the changes in the brain and the parts of the brain that respond when we get present in the moment. Um, yeah. Does this go along with that? I mean, you have some, you have some experience with that and you put that into rock steady. Yeah, it's huge. I would say, so mindfulness skills are about presence and non-judgment. So, so coming into what am I, what am I feeling and sensing and how can I be unbiased? Mm -hmm. So I'm no longer running away from pain, judging things as I like them. I don't like them. I want this. I don't want that. We, we don't want to be stuck on the craving of sex, drugs and rock and roll. We, we want to be in this non-attached place of showing up as I am. All feelings welcome, all emotions welcome. So even if right now I'm just feeling guilt in the pit of my stomach, the, the mindfulness skills allow us to stay present and unbiased. So they almost become the water we're swimming in. And, but funnily enough, I've had mindfulness-based psychologists, clinical psychologists go through rock steady because they're so stuck and they can't heal. So it's mm. not everything. These are little tools in the toolkit but we have to have this integrated approach that helps us to listen to the wisdom of the body. The body is talking to us. These sensations are talking to us. They're bringing us into present moment. And I like to think of our sensory system as our inner GPS, that it's helping us right. stay right. in alignment with our soul connection this lifetime. So when I'm feeling a little not quite right and visual spotting and dotting, or I'm feeling a bit woozy, if that happened to me, I'd be like, okay, what choices am I making that are not right? What, when am I saying things that's not in alignment with me? And my body's like, come back, come back. You're losing yourself. You're dissociating. And then I have to, I pause, I can come back, I can check in and I can re-engage in the process and I can choose again. And it can, my experience is that it be, instead of it becoming a chronic problem, it becomes a momentary blip that I can address mm -hmm. and, and stay back as me in my safety, in my body and, and have access to this cycle of self forgiveness and self acceptance. Because I think no one's perfect. I'm not perfect. We're constantly falling on and off the path and having to recalibrate and come back in. And that really, I think, can become the gift of tinnitus, vertigo, and dizziness is they really bring us back to our truth. And they're so loud and so distressing and so disruptive, we can't ignore them anymore. Ignoring, denying, distracting, medicating is not working. So we have to listen and say, okay, body, you're wise. You've got innate intelligence. I get it. I'm studying neuroscience. I get it. You're smart. How can I listen to you? And that opens up a whole new space of study. And that's, that's where I think... If you're out there and listening to this and saying, I have tried everything. I've tried psychologists. I've tried osteopaths. I've tried chiropractors, physical therapists, medications. I still don't feel quite right. I just want you to know it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. you, you love yourself enough to try all of those therapies. You've got a great sense of self-care and self-commitment. And my suggestion would be, are you willing to redirect that back into yourself instead of going out to an expert and saying to the expert, tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And I've been there. I get that. Perhaps Kathleen has too. I desperately wanted someone to fix me at, at a low point in my journey. It was a desperation. Um, but then when I noticed no one could and that that was killing me, I had to kind of, I was almost forced into this willingness to start navigating it on my own and feeling my way through my healing process, even though it was hard and uncomfortable. I started to get there in really small, steady steps. I started to get these little moments of reward of feeling what I wanted to feel because I'd cultivated it. I was starting to work the system. And little by little, of course, I just recalibrated myself back to normal. So the book Rocksteady that's coming out, um, is this, does, if you buy the book and read it, and I had an opportunity to read it, is this going to be everything somebody needs to understand or does it direct them to your online support? Because it sounds like community and 
continuity of this new way of thinking is a really important part of it because you're changing the way people are going to see the world, interact with the world, see themselves, judge themselves, get rid of shame. I mean, there's so many things that are yeah. forever. Um, and continuing that self-care to not fall back into a recurrence of their symptoms, which the body sometimes will come back and remind us again, hey, you need to yeah. get back to some self-care. It's going yeah. to gonna speak to us again if we ignore it. Um, talk about that. Because earlier I was saying, so who's the program for? And you said, oh, it's for everybody. I don't recommend it for anyone, but it's for whoever it resonates with. And then what is it? It's an online community. It's a book. It's a program. It's a teaching. Is it self-paced? Do people need a yeah. commitment of a certain amount of time? Talk about that. So um, to start with the book, I deliberately wrote the book wanting it to be an, an educational high value resource that health professionals and doctors could read so that they would have an understanding of what else exists out there. Because I think a lot of my colleagues, including definitely audiologists, they just have no idea what I do. They're just like, well, Joey's different. Hmm. What is like, does she do relaxation? I don't know. So, so this book is to answer that question. Okay. What is it I'm doing? What is this new therapy? It's also a great resource for family members. So let's say you have had chronic debilitating vertigo, dizziness or tinnitus, and you just know no one understands you. Give them the book, let them read the book, and then they can have a little insight into what you're feeling, what you're going through and what the process forwards can be so they can support you. For people who have any unwanted sensations, whether it's sounds or feelings, um, any, any vestibular condition, of course, this book is really for you so you can get an understanding of why you may feel stuck, hopeless, hopeless or powerless and why you may feel like you've just got to tolerate symptoms forever and live with it when I'm saying, no, that's not true. Learn how to reset and rewire your symptoms. You don't have to live with it. You can live through it and become an entirely new person at the other end of it. So the book is for all those different communities and different types of readers um, I imagine there'll be some people out there with relatively mild conditions or early onset conditions and the book will answer all of their questions and give them all of the home exercises they need to to return to normal and to have the motivation and the willingness because um, in some cases it can be quite a quick elegant solution it's not chronic yet it's not complicated it's not mm -hmm. complex for others with more chronic, complicated concerns, worries, and anxieties, they may choose to, to enter the online community mm -hmm. and, and have the six modules, have all the videos and audios and resources to, to play and explore in their own time. Because that the Rocksteady online program, in a sense, is really a vortex that helps hold people in that new mindset until it automates it so it's like you kind of need some babysitting mm, and some yeah. structure and some support while we're unlearning and dealing with a lot of worries and doubts and am i good enough and the program keeps you coming back to yes you're good enough it's normal to feel this way stay with it ask yourself what you need you know listen to another group call like it's 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 got all that kind of cushy belonging that can definitely be the essential piece to help us shift gears. So um, I hope, did that answer the question for you? Yes, oh, and how much yes. Day? You said how many, how much of the commitment a day? Mm -hmm. Really, it's up to you. I suggest at least 15 minutes a day. Um, from a neuroplasticity point of view, the more we're feeling what we want to feel, the more we're wiring that feeling in. So 15 minutes is, it's a pretty small commitment, but believe it or not, if you think about playing the piano 15 minutes a day, you will learn the piano. If you do 15 minutes of piano a day, you will come out the other end of it with piano skills. So it's, it's a small commitment, but what I notice is that's kind of like my entry level recommendation for people who are brand new to any yoga practice or any neuroplasticity concept or mindfulness. I'm like, just start with that. But what tends to happen is people go through the program and they go through it again. It's like spiral learning where every time you do a module, you go deeper. So you can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. What people tend to do is then integrate it into their life. So they'll be in the car and doing an exercise. They'll be on a right. work break and doing an exercise. They'll be before bed and doing an exercise in the shower, meeting a friend, what ever that's right uh, for, for me one of my exercises became surfing you know i was terrified of the ocean again my anxiety and then you know just an anxiety is my baseline and i wanted to face fear and learn to move through fear 
And so surfing actually became um, a practice for me to feel fear and move through it and coach and support myself through it. And the reason I did that was because I loved the ocean. So I was moving through a fear to arrive at a love and to have that connection of, of surfing on the wave and being in the ocean. And the higher the fear we move through, the higher the joy we arrive at. Mm -hmm. And the intensity mm -hmm. of emotion gives you more neural input. So if it's just a tiny little irk, you just get a few neurons firing. If it's a big fear, you get a lot more neural bang for your buck. So once I could move through that fear and then be on the wave in joy and I forget my fears and I'm, I'm connected and I'm doing it and I'm in my joy, I actually get a, a better neuroplasticity result, if that makes any sense. So, and I might surf for an hour. So I say 15 minutes a day, but really it becomes a way of life. And um, the live group calls are anywhere from 60 minutes to two hours. So there's, it's almost like you've got this custom designed podcast that you can listen to at your fingertips. So some people will listen to that at night if they can't sleep. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very robust program. It's incredibly dense. There's a lot in there and it, could, when people could enter the program, when they, when they decide to subscribe or is it purchase it, is this lifetime access that they get or is it a yeah, monthly yeah. sort of subscription no, 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 that no, no, people no. have? No, it's a lifetime access. And I was just about to say, some people take two years to go through the whole program. There's just so much in there and you can really just take your time and relax through it at a, a leisurely pace. Um, so really people have nothing to, nothing to lose by joining the Rocksteady community going on and trying it out because they can take their time. It sounds like it's very much, yeah, while it has structure to it, it's very much because it comes from you and you getting to know yourself. It, it's however much time people need and it's all okay. Yeah. And some people will like not do the program for a while because they feel fine. Mm -hmm. And then an, an episode will come back or, you know, I've had clients who have gone through job redundancy or their partner's got cancer or some kind of big stress. And they're like the rock steady program really helped them to remain in their calm, in their steady. So even beyond the vertigo, dizziness or tinnitus, it gives life skills. It helps us to just move through difficult situations and challenges. And well, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, sign me up. I don't have vertigo or tinnitus, but I think the, um, the idea of suspending self-judgment the idea of being content with our bodies and our place where we are and giving ourselves permission to be vulnerable and imperfect and um, to learn and then embracing whatever it is about us that's, that's moving. And that steadiness is not stillness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and there's, there's one last piece I want to just throw out there too is, you know, some people live in third world countries and there's a lot of people out there who are single parenting and, life is really tough and really hard and I get that and I've a lot of empathy and compassion and for the last three years I've been um, offering financial assistance to people who are truly in financial just duress and so I, I just want people to know finance doesn't have to be a barrier we have scholarships mm -hmm. and we have a just pay what you can process for people who truly need it the program is there for you too and I think it's important and, and I get this because of my journey, you know, it, it can, we can get ourselves into this mental pickle of just nothing goes my way. Like here's this awesome program. It looks so good, but I've got no cash. It's like, we have to challenge that belief. How can we find a way to get the support we need? We have scholarships available. You're worthy of this program. It takes a lot of courage to say, I want this program. And if I don't have the money, cause for whatever reason, I have to believe in myself and have that humility to then apply for scholarship. So I, I just want to, there are so many barriers to getting mm -hmm. started with healing. Even just moving through that is part of the therapy. It is. And I feel so strongly that your passion for this, your gift to the world is to say there's no there's no barriers to healing because within us um, and within the universe and within our amazing nervous system is healing, which doesn't mean freedom from symptoms and doesn't mean freedom from challenges and no. bad feelings, bad days and whatever. 
it means contentment with what we have and to be alive is to feel. So yes. I think that, that um, this, you, your approach to life, your approach to wellness, it just resonates with me. I know that it probably includes even what does my body want to eat and what should I feed it? I mean, there's all, it's just, a, it just applies to everything. Um, yeah. us and taking and, care and, of our body. And sensuality and sexuality too, that really gets overlooked. But I think also just enabling ourselves to feel sexy and to have pleasure it's also a part of healing. You know, it's, it's all of us. It's the whole person. And when we open up all of these conversations, we can begin to move through those bits of us that are blocked and stuck. Absolutely. I, um, I have told stories about how, as a vestibular therapist, um, someone's sexuality and sensuality and self-love and love of partner and allowing themselves to receive love became the central focus of their vestibular rehab journey. And it's like, what? How could you do that? I was like, well, yeah. it's wherever the blocks are. And we don't really know what they are. So what I like what you're doing is you're um, allowing people to rummage around in their body and in their mental closet where they have perhaps have these blocks that are keeping them from contentment and from fullness and fulfillment in their life. And um, anyone interested, I mean, we can all benefit from doing that. And I really love that it gives people acceptance in a community um, there, and removes the shame of being misunderstood, misdiagnosed, or even accurately diagnosed, but without a magic pill. So many of the people in our vestibular community are chronically struggling with issues that I think yeah. your program addresses. Yeah. And um, I'm happy to see that it is um, getting the platform through the social media and your YouTube channel and now your book that my hope is that it will reach the hands of all those who need it. And yeah. I appreciate your courage for coming out with what seemed to be part of your journey that included some struggles and that you yeah. turned that around and said, this is yeah. why this happened to me. Because you're saying my journey with vertigo is needed, what needed to happen for me to become my full self and to, to fulfill my purpose. And I, I think believe, it, yeah. I believe people will come to understand why they had vertigo and then yeah. working through that yeah. will allow and them to fulfill their purpose. And I think some of my closing statements would, it can be easy. Like often fighting our symptoms and fighting what we're feeling is so much more difficult, exhausting, draining, and expensive than actually just going, you know what, this is what I feel and this is what I'm going to do about it. And I'm just going to do it with love if I have to. Like, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm so tired. I'm just going to lean into it and be kind to myself. Like that actually becomes a lot easier than pushing through and pretending and faking it. And I know, cause I did a lot of faking it. And I also want to say, whatever you're feeling, it's not your fault. You are not to blame. Whatever you're feeling, there will be <clears throat> a whole host of reasons, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You may not understand them right now and you may not understand them ever. And that's okay too, but you're allowed to feel what you feel. It's completely valid, normal, and okay even if it's a really difficult feeling. And I suppose I just want to instill hope. And even if people listening to this are like, yeah, yeah, whatever, it's okay to not be ready as well. Like that's the beauty of having this online world. There's, there's no time limit. If, if we don't feel ready to dive into this deeper relationship with ourselves and some of these deeper questions, which can be confronting and icky, mm -hmm. I would say get, a lot, get the support you need, ideally getting some sleep, ideally having a bit of nutrition and nourishment just to get that strength in the body. Because often it's when we relax a little bit and, and have a baseline kind of health that we can really go deeper into this work. If we're very high strung and sickly and tired and weak, it's hard to get vulnerable. Um, not that it's impossible, but... And then the last thing I want to say is there, there is... Uh, reading a book and doing an online program are really the essential self-study educational pieces for going in, but it doesn't replace private therapy or working with a therapist who you trust, who can hold you, who can, who can just be that buoyancy for moments when you do feel like you're falling apart. So not everybody's going to need therapy or a private therapist, but I just wanted to say it's normal to need that. I've had heaps of therapy and I feel like this was all my apprenticeship to, to mm -hmm. doing the work and having the passion I have um, 
so I, I'm really grateful for my challenges and my struggles and all of it really. Cause it's, I'm at peace with it getting to me to this place. Mm-hmm. And I feel resourced for the challenges that are yet to come. And I think to Correct. me, that's a successful outcome is when someone says, you know what? I don't care if I get another vestibular migraine episode or I have no fear of persistent perceptual dizziness, triple PD or BBBV. I have no fear of it coming back because I know exactly what to do. I'm completely resourced. That feels good. And that to me is a healthy, happy outcome. And that's taking your power back. Yeah. Yeah. You have nothing to fear anymore. No. And that's what you talk about. Well, being with you is like getting a wonderful hug, a wonderful big (laughs) hug. And I hope people feel that. And sometimes that's a great place to start. So, you know, for me being with you, it was a pleasure and a privilege. And for those listening to you, I just hope they feel that warmth, that hug and that acceptance and love that, that comes through from your voice. I could go on for hours. We'll have to do a second segment to dive into some things sooner, but I really, really appreciate you being uh, so open and sharing your story with people. And, and I hope that um, many people find your book and tell them where they can find it again and where they can find you. Well, visit seekingbalance.com.au to find me. And on my website, I have invitations to free monthly live group calls to meet your peers. We have really exciting discussions on topics of healing with neuroplasticity. So that's a monthly free offering. I'll have my book launch in mid-November. And I will have links to where you can purchase the book, but it'll be all the major online retailers. If you pop in Rocksteady, the book into Amazon or Booktopia, wherever you'll be able to find the book. And if you do love my work, I would love a review. If you can review my book, that helps more people find me and um, helps the community grow. Where do you want them to review the book? Wherever they buy it. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, online. Well, thank you. And um, so long to you. Be well and continue to do all the wonderful and amazing things you're doing, Joey. It's a privilege. I can't wait to see you again and uh, to see your book launch and participate in that. Right back at you, Kathleen. Thank you so much for your support. It's beautiful to connect with you as well. I'm really, really humbled.